fabric of not just not just this community, this organization, uh, but the entire field of implied improvisation. So please help me welcome to the stage um, Joel Venistra, of course, Teresa Dudak, with the legacies of Keith Johnson, the Global Improvisation Initiative, where we come from and where we come next. All right, let's give them a round of applause. Hey, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Fantastic. So glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. Hi, what are we doing first? Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, this is Joel Beenstra, superhuman, um, professor and the vice chair of department at the Department of Drama at UC Irvine's Claire Trevor School of the Arts. Um, this year, he was awarded with the 2023 Oscar Brockett Outstanding Teacher, Teacher Award by the Association of Theater and Higher Education. Huge, huge. Professors, they teach you not to like failure. 
I'm sure they did. But you cover them and you do without failing. So they have to teach you, teach you a different attitude towards failure. They teach you to hate it. No. Yeah, failing, it means you we can now teach you because you failed. You can't learn anything without failing. Therefore, we have to change your attitude to failure. Any idea will do if it inspires the person, but most people turn to ideas because they've been through this stupid training of have been searching for the best idea. In fact, you learned at school to tempt yourself up and aha, I do better. Give me another chance. You just spin yourself with tension and that causes fear. And in my opinion, doing your best is the same as stage fright. That there's this terrible culture in which everyone's taught to do their best. When you see a mind class, and the teacher was cross, he said, no, no, no. And you look as if you're walking in deep sand. <laughs> I thought, why don't you say, hey, hey, fantastic. You discover the mind for walking in deep sand. <laughs> it would be just the same. And it wouldn't be so negative. I was so naive, I thought acting, who are afraid of the audience? All actors are afraid, I didn't understand that. That's why they don't look right people. I don't want to see all these frightened people on the stage. Normal acting does not deal with fear, and you're supposed to hide it. It's like that Swedish guy who said that uh, he was, he'd always known he was scared. But he didn't know the others were equally scared until I arrived and started exploring the fear. You can't teach spontaneity, but you can get people to not do the things that stop them being spontaneous. Spontaneity, you don't teach spontaneity, you remove the obstacles. And of course the main obstacle is you, your social self, which is so concerned with being approved of and liked and all the rest of that. And it screws you up. The action is so simple you can't grasp it, is it? One person is changed by another. That's it. Wonderful actors make wonderful changes. Profound changes. And the great playwrights make profound and wonderful changes. This is so simple. How could one not see that? When I began to teach improvisation, I was astounded at all the things the improvisers did to, to wreck themselves because they were so negative and they can't. If they lit a fire, it would start to rain. That's a problem of people wanting to be original, so they reject what their mind gives them because they've seen it before, they've been taught not to cheat. You can't cheat in improvisation. There are no new ideas if you've been long enough. <laughs> it is obvious, people will like it. We've been trained the opposite. We've been trained that we're not good enough and we have to do extra stuff. By ourselves, we're not innately worth anything. So you use more effort. You can be a wonderful improviser, but you'd be better if you use less effort. Well, improvisers have an inefficient way because they don't want to all be all them. I teach you to be boring, but not depressed. People are, well, I do see when people have interviewed me, they often told me that I didn't want the scenes to be funny. But if they take my advice, they'd be a hell of a lot funnier. You have to teach improvisers to think inside the box. Or you can't work with them. You say to the mask actor, you say, make your mask at the mask, you're seeing the nose, going to find a sound. Yeah. Yeah. And I said the thing in the mirror would make a sound. I haven't said you make a sound. That's devious. <laughs> Once you're an experienced improviser, it's ridiculous not to kill ideas, because some ideas deserve a quick death. If you didn't kill any ideas, it would all be like deflated sex dolls or salvable garden clocks. There'd be no guts to anything. Nothing would be limp and pathetic. But you'd have no resistance. Of course you have to kill ideas and all the things you say you shouldn't do when you start. In the end, of course you can do for pleasure, but not from fear. The thing about improvisation, if it's not risky, it's not worth doing. Keith, what, what makes you a good improviser? And uh, generosity and no fear. The audience connects things 
but the improvisers disconnect because they've been taught to be original, but the real knowledge is in the audience. They know when to laugh, they know when to pay attention. If you direct a play, if you're not an idiot, and you get the audience and you watch the audience, because you're only guessing the audience know when it's good and bad. But the idea that the audience might educate us instead of us as the knowledge educating the audience, there's some sort of heresy in that happen. The audience wants to connect everything. The improvisers want to disconnect everything. So now you teach it, and people think, oh, that of course. <laughs> It took me years to find that. And what 
is sort of our goal with the GII, part of our goal. Um, he was an adult liberatory educator. Um, and um, to use a bit of Paulo Freire's terminology, he decoded the coded dance of social behavior and created techniques so that we, his students, could truthfully recreate that behavior on the stage. Yes. <laughs> yes, he wanted us to experience and, and, and have those uncensored moments, but he was very clear throughout his life that we needed to understand why the experience mattered. Um, and that we understood the theories, and, and you know, he, everything he created was a solution to a problem, so we needed to understand that. Um, so, here's the quote from Paulo Freire that I really like, and sort of, of course, Paulo Freire, if you don't know, wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which inspired Boal's Theater of the Oppressed. Um, he was also a critical pedagogue um, uh, educator for Brazil. Um, but I really like this, this idea of um, understanding the whole, the whole system. I call Keith Johnstone's uh, um, oeuvre of work the impro system because it is, it's a complete system of training. And um, when we only apprehended the fragments of it, then we missed sort of the richness and depth of how the system works in its Completeness. Oh, I'm going to switch over my nose and I can't do it with my hand. Okay. Um, um, anyway, so uh, so I think Joel and I are really clear that in our work as educators, as scholars, um, and many of you have this empirical evidence, like you studied with Keith, right? You you've been in the same space with him, and and I think it's our our job, our duty, to pass this along to the next generation, to uh, to know our historicity, right? Um, and, and that should be our starting point. Uh, this is sort of my goal as a scholar, um, especially as Keith Johnson's literary executor, like passing on his life legacy. Um, but um, if we know our historicity, then we know our unique point of departure. We're not recreating the wheel, right? We're building on it. We're finding new methodology. Um, so uh, Keith understood this. He never missed an opportunity to cite sources and people who inspired his work, to share theories that underpinned his improvisational exercises and techniques. He even treated audiences like students. Every, every space was a classroom for him. He called the audience a large, intelligent beast that needed to be tickled. And, and with audiences, this is, I mean, here she talks about it. They would have a thousand Germans out there, you know, or whatever, wherever they toured in Europe, and he would explain in minute detail the techniques and theories that were underpinning the work that was unfolding on the stage. So uh, he coded, he decoded the coded dance even for the audience. So I call Keith's classrooms and spaces laboratories to investigate the nature of spontaneous creation. And like scientists, Keith never stopped questioning the knowledge or changing the variables in the experiments, always in pursuit of better knowledge, better methodology. And, um, and this is a quote that I often use. Um, and it's really important, right? So not, not that you can't create your own thing, but we, but we need to honor like our field, you know, and our pioneers, as, as other fields of study do. And um, John Stone was one of our pioneers. So go ahead, I'm gonna let you tear it down. So the essential thing is that we being aware of where we exist in history, it's really essential for people to think about where we want to go into the future. I mean, certainly we've all been inspired by this conference. I've been inspired already this time. I've been to many of these, but it's been pretty outstanding to learn and grow from this together, to be aware of our history, our shared roots. In terms of Keith's work, there's a couple things that stick out with me that are kind of interesting. The first thing is that Keith Johnstone, when he was doing his original work, uh, he also uh, toured with the theater machine around Europe, didn't call it in or improvisation, like some of us don't want to use that term, because no one knew what that was. It didn't exist before his time. It provoked by telling you that people it was a mind group that he was going to do. Also, <laughs> yeah, you laugh, right? yeah, like, what is Keith? Sometimes lose our conceptualization of where we are at the time or our lives, and we think that things are just always as they are now, or what we 
to point out. It's actually a deep history that can go beyond into where we come from and lessons to be learned. Have you been on the AI on Facebook? It's amazing. There's so much truth in your mind from there. In addition, Keith generally is a side coach and direct from the side. People think Keith Johnstone, and sometimes they think, oh, he was an improviser on stage. But he was actually more like a facilitator like us, helping to guide people towards changing their acting with each other and giving each other a good time on stage. And the third thing, which I think is really tremendous, that he, that Teresa noted already, is the fact that he was doing this work legally in England. Again, it was, it was a legal practice because everything was censored that was on the British stage. And so he needed this professional mission. He just went ahead and did it. And it was kind of dangerous to take any risk. And we should do such things as well as we try to inspire. And yet, this art form went on to directly inspire group signings anyways, which we all were excited about. Tom Mockery last night. Tom Mockery would not be there without Keith Johnson. We're all part of this legacy and this deep, rich background. And yeah, yeah, you can give a pause for that. That's very nice. Yes. Well, of course, a session is a family tree or this long ribbon of history that you are adding to and developing and being a part of. And as we reimagine the future, which is so important, we also want to make sure that we're honor the past and aware of the present where we are at with the important and different things that are going on. In light of that, Teresa and I started with the Global Improvisation Initiative in 2016. Inspired by AIM, actually, because this is a group of applied improvisers that are using this work to in applied fields. We were like, what about improvisers? People that just do this theatrically or in other frameworks for entertainment? Because we don't have time to be at conferences. We have festivals where you see entertainment. You have theaters that are homes for training. But you don't have a collective mindset for learning and thinking about the history. And improvisation as an art form is so ephemeral, right? Every opening night is also a closing night. And we often only reflect on it after at the bar, and that's about it. And so we're trying to document and be mindful of the art form. And so we've created a symposium where we come together and share the tactics and things that are being utilized as well as performance things, and notice the whole spectrum of theatrical improvisation. We document it, honor it. We had our first symposium in 2017 in Southern California. We had our next one in London in 2019. In 2021, there was something that happened in the world, so we had to do it online. Uh, and that was uh, Finally, exciting to connect people all over the world. This past year, we were in Southern California on a smaller scale. And in 2020 we look forward to going to the Pacific Northwest for the next uh, event. But again, just denoting and being mindful of our history. And AIN and GII are both a part of a shared history like sister organizations that hopefully inspire and honor each other through the lens in the way that we are all connected in this global sphere. Uh, so I I was with Keith in the hospital in the you know towards the end and um, in one of my last conversations with him I was sitting by his side and um, I asked him and he was all there right to the end very curious still thinking still I was bringing him poems by William Blake and he was unpacking them for me it was <sighs> anyway such a gift but I asked him if you had one wish. That's really hard for Keith, like to narrow it to only one wish. I said, if a genie gave you only one wish, Keith, please listen, one wish, what would, what would that be? And he said this, I want to stop people from being greedy. And they, oh, and they, okay, and make them understand. To be happy, you have to do things for other people. That's what he said. I learned this from Keith Johnson. I learned this from Bruce Duda. I learned this from this 
source or this source, it just underpins our work and even gives us more value and credibility and credential. Yeah. Benevolence. Benevolence, kindness, be good to one another. That's how we change the world and do it for this work and these principles. I would imagine for you, if you've been here before, or if you this is on the planet, you have some mentor or some collaborator or somebody that's really made an impact on you. I know many are in this room right now who have tremendous impact on me. He had a tremendous impact on me. And uh, folks like Sue Walden, who's retired, no longer with the time. Yes, absolutely. She was tremendous, tremendously impact on me. All these people change our lives, and yet so often we forget about it, move forward, and just do the present work and don't remember that past. So I want to invite you to do two things. Three things, sorry, three things. Best things come to the First thing, on the count of three, you can just take a moment and think about some mentor that's meant something to you. And on the count of three, we just say that mentor's name together. Somebody has an impact on you. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Next, after we end the session, we were potentially going to do this in the session, but I'm mindful of time. And so I'm going to invite you that after the session, maybe share a story about that mentor, or share a story about Keith who spent time with him. Connect with somebody else and share a little bit of the life that you've experienced. Because every time we lose somebody, we lose so much knowledge and so many stories and so much connection, and the only way we can bring that back up is by sharing with one another, one another. And so that's very important. And last but not least, there's somebody in this room who's had a positive impact on you. Take the time while they're still alive to thank them for that positive impact. It's a gift that we don't have forever, and we want to make sure we encourage and support and uplift one another and be benevolent with one another all the time we have together. And so that going forward, we know what we're going to do together. Thank you. Thank you.